but he's going to put it underneath for me on the screen, which is all right. That, that's what I was checking with a while ago. 308. Before we get started. Now, this is, this is a little different tonight, what I'm going to do. The Father had me go through things very slowly. And he said, after, ever, after, ever verse, I want you to tell them what I'm saying spiritually to you. And I did that. So we're going to take this verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept. And it's not going to be a big, little, quick through. We're going to go very slowly. And right now, after y'all have eaten, got to wake up. Because <laughs> I want you to really concentrate. And this will be good because at any level you can receive this. And the Father's got all purpose with his rhema today. <laughs> We're up. You'll be start. Oh. Okay. This is Dwight Davis. I'm here today. We're in the Spiritual Identity and Sonship Conference, and we're here in Dallas, Texas. And we've been talking all day about these different things. And last night I shared with you a, a little bit about the Father's purpose and glory. Tonight I'm going to share with you about the Father's purpose for spiritual birth, spiritual birthing. And so let's uh, start here. I'm going to take this very slowly. We're going to go through this. I'm going to pray just before we start. That's not a habit. or I just feel led of the Father to do that. Father, I just thank you for today. I thank you that you're going to make your word, your rhema through me, be spoken such that anybody can hear it, anybody can know it, anybody can understand it according to your will and your spirit. Just lead us and guide us by your spirit as we live in you in all things, even today. May it be for your purpose and your glory. Father, amen. So uh, before the world or anything was created, it was the Father's ultimate intention. I mean ultimate intention. To, he purposed to have spiritual birth in his own, have for his own spiritual sons. That was his ultimate intention. Even before he created angels, even before he created animals or the earth or us, that was his ultimate intention. So out of love, that's what he wanted. And all of this other thing is just to help him accomplish what he really wanted was having spiritual sons. The Father planned to give them eternal life and give them his new nature with a new spirit identity as his own spiritual sons. We are all individually, once we've been born again, a new spiritual son of the Father. All individually. What mother is saying that our Father's done and planned out of his glorious love for us? Because our Father, as we've talked several times today, is the giver of total agape love. That's a hundred percent determined love, no matter what. He didn't say, if some of them are good, I'm going to give them this. Some of them may be okay, maybe. And only the good ones I'll give. No, he said, everyone in mankind, I'm going to give them the opportunity to be a part of my love and to be a part of having a spiritual identity as a spiritual son, if they'd only believe. Now, that's out of his love. Our Father's a giver of this love. He planned to want us individually to be recipients of that love. And when we are and return that love, that's even better. The Father did not want to force his love on us. He didn't want us to be puppets. You know, he wants to make free will decisions to choose him as our Father and make the decision to love him and to receive him. Well, he wanted to make uh, us have that freedom in everything we do, and so we're always given that free will and the opportunity to do that. The spiritual birth process was the only way to begin and achieve giving us that eternal salvation and reconciliation with our Father. And this was done for all mankind. So when Jesus died on the cross, he died and shed his blood, crucified body for all of mankind. And everybody's sins, past, present, and free forgave all future sins were all taken care of and done away with by his shed blood. In the beating place, was on the cross. And his shed blood, broken body gave us his holiness he gave us imputed righteousness so we could receive him now jesus talked about nicodemus and i'm going to talk to you a little bit about out of john 3 and this is probably used quite frequently but we're going to talk about the entire passage of nicodemus here get this thing stop that there we go john 3 1 through 8 
there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. We know that. Now, the Lord's telling me that, uh, you know, the Nicodemus was probably likely the head of the Sanhedrin. He wasn't just a leader. He was probably the head leader. Now, you know what? That's was all this stuff he had was from below, as we said. Oh, he was a good leader, and he was a good Pharisee, and he probably, but you know, he heard something from Jesus. He could not put his finger on, and all of his training and understanding, it was far beyond him, and he didn't understand it. So he came to Jesus at night. He didn't want anybody to see him there, because after all, he was a leader, and he did. Uh, they were really not for Jesus at all. So it said the, the same, verse 2, came to Jesus, uh, which was Christ, and he came, remember, as a as the Son of Man. He came in sinful flesh, just like us. Not with that one sin, but, but able to sin. By night he said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art teacher come from God. We can tell that. God the Father he's talking about. For no man can do these miracles that you do except God the Father be with him. And of course, Nicodemus was speaking for the leadership of the Jews because they'd already murmured amongst themselves and talked that Jesus was obviously a teacher for God. How could he know these things otherwise? But they didn't understand. They only saw the miracles. But even he healed on the Sabbath day, as one of our teachers said. And yet, why would he do that? I mean, does he know the law? But they were all thinking amongst themselves. So he came out as the spokesman, so to speak, to for, for all that they were thinking in their hearts and minds. But well, look what Jesus answered in verse 3. He answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the man be born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. Now, you know, you think uh, the kingdom of God would be real easy, but we saw above the line. You can't do see that in the natural. You can't see it in the flesh. You can't see it in your original identity. Unless you've been born again, you can't even see anything. And so, thank God he takes blind people and gives them sight. <laughs> what a wonder that our Father can do so that they can get above the line. <laughs> Jesus clearly declares that a person must be born again to even see the things of God. You can't see it. You can't understand it. You can't perceive it. It means nothing to you. As, <laughs> as I said, the Greeks, it was foolishness, you know, because they, did, they didn't understand anything that, that was being said. But Nicodemus said unto Jesus, How can a man be born again? When he's old, and enter in time the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, the key is Nicodemus thought that spiritual birthing was like rebirthing again in the natural. I, I gotta get down as this big man in my mother's womb and and you know, and and I don't know how to do that. But he that's what he thought. It was a natural birthing done over again. But Jesus answered real quickly, says, Verily, verily I say to you, except a man be born of water. And of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's a lot of questions about that born of water. I've had preachers even preach, and people that say they're Christians or in Christianity, whatever you want to call it, that said that water is baptism. It has nothing to do with baptism. In fact, if they just read on to the next few verses, they'd get the message. But, but he's talking about something totally different here. Born of water and the Spirit, two different things he cannot enter into. Now, at first you can't see it, but now you've got to be born again to even enter into the kingdom of God. You just don't get into it just in the natural. Jesus begins to clarify the difference from natural, original birthing in the flesh, which is what our born of the water means, and spiritual birthing that's required to even enter into the kingdom of God. In fact, he comes and explains it in verse 6. And why don't we take the words of Jesus instead of making it baptism or something we think about religiously? That is born of the flesh is flesh. That's the natural birthing. That is our original identity that we were birthed into. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That is the spiritual identity. A spiritual son of God. A, a new birthing and a new identity. All there in that one verse. Jesus makes it clear that the birth of the flesh is flesh. Or one's original identity. And the spirit birth is our new spiritual identity. Now Jesus said marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. So Jesus rehearses again to Nicodemus, not to marvel, not to be trying to think to get into your mother's womb again or anything like that, or thinking this is something impossible. He says he's talking about a new spiritual birthing to enter the things of the Spirit. But he goes on and explains how that will take place in verse 8. The wind bloweth, where it listeth, and this is a type of the Holy Spirit, 
and you hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell where it came from and where it goes. So is everybody born of the Spirit. So what he's telling you here, the Holy Spirit is coming. He's the one that's going to birth us into the family of God, and he's the one that's coming from someplace. We may not always know where it is. I've had people tell me, that I said, you know when you're born again? And some people say, well, I know when I did this and this and this. And somebody said, I walked an aisle one day. And I said, well, what made you walk that aisle? What made you even go to church that day? What made you even think about that? Well, I, I, all week I've been, well, did you make a decision that week sometimes? Maybe, I don't know. We don't maybe know when the Holy Spirit breathed on us to actually physically birth us. If you think you know, that's great. But if you don't know, it's okay according to this verse. Because it says the Spirit blows where it wants to, and you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it came from and where it goes, so is everybody born of the Spirit. Now, I say, if you're born of the Spirit, you'll know it. You may not know when it happened, but you may know now that it has happened, and you've been changed because of it. And that's okay. Just knowing that your change is good. Now, what the Lord told me on this, <coughs> Jesus clearly declares that every one of mankind must be born again to see or enter into the kingdom of the Father. The wind is the type of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is declaring that the Holy Spirit is vitally involved with the Spirit birth process. And we may not be able to tell when the Spirit birth takes place. However, we should know sometime after the Spirit birth has taken place, and we can see the difference in our life. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Paul tells us this, For by one Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, we are all baptized, and this isn't, Water baptism again. This is spirit baptism, or spirit birth into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and all have been made to drink of one spirit. Wow, one spirit. Paul confirms the same word of Jesus, that the Holy Ghost Spirit is one who baptizes or spirit births us into one body of Christ, and that's Christ and the Father all at the same time. Paul also confirms the same word of Jesus about not being able to see or hear the things of the Spirit in the natural, original birthing and identity. Now, several people have talked about this today, and uh, so we're going to repeat it again. It must be important. The Father has had all of us see this and go through these things. But it is written, I have not seen. Your natural eye cannot see, or your natural ear cannot hear, or have entered into the heart of man, not even your natural fleshly heart thinking can enter into the heart of the things which God the Father has prepared to the beloved. See, your original physical identity, all your fleshly eyes, your ears and heart cannot see, hear, or even perceive the things that our Father has prepared for us who love Him. Wow. You know, you just can't do it in the natural. This is not something about us doing anything. It's about us receiving from Him. And so we can't do it in our natural sight. We do it only with his spiritual insight and his spiritual sight and hearing after we've heard his voice and he's worked the deal in his own spirit. But God the Father, verse 10, hath revealed him unto us by his spirit. For the spirit, or the Holy Spirit, searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God the Father. Look here, the Father has revealed his full knowledge. This is the epigenosical knowledge upon knowledge or knowledge that goes. And that, that that's what's good because, see, when that knowledge gets Upon knowledge, then it comes together and becomes understanding in that flow of the two rivers coming together, as we talked about. By the Holy Spirit, as the Father sends him to reveal all things, including the deep things in his purpose and intent and plan, including all things around the mystery and spiritual son identity, which we need more than anything in this day and time. It's unfortunately we don't. However, you don't you won't be able to see or hear anything in spirit till you hear, receive, and believe in Jesus Christ and his finished work with the Father's acceptance and resurrection of Jesus for your hundred percent complete salvation. Look at Romans ten nine and ten. I know you've heard these salvation scriptures, but I, I think there's a lot more to it than what we've ever seen. But what saith it? It's the rhema word ever is nigh you. Why? Even in your mouth and the heart. It's the rhema word that the preacher is preaching. Wow. I always like the first 24. We read 1 Peter 1, 23. We're born again by the word, the corrupt word of God. That's the logos. But it says that by the word, the rhema word of God that we preached is what you hear. So when we hear it, builds faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And so it, when you believe it in your heart and receive it, 
by faith, that's what we preach. The spoken word is the preach word to you. It's a rhema, and it builds faith or belief in your heart. So we can't get the belief in our heart on our own. We always think we do. I always like uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not of yourself for the belief. It's not of yourself for the faith. It's not of yourself for anything. He even gives you the faith. But Romans 12, 3 says, unto every one man among you is given the measure of faith. He gave us the measure of faith even to believe. So it's all come by what the Father is doing and working in our lives through the Holy Spirit. That if you will confess with your mouth, verse 9, the Lord Jesus. Now look what it says right here. This is most important. Most people don't even know this. I'll ask 10, uh, well, I'll pick, pick 100 Christians, and I'll ask him how you get saved. Oh, I got Jesus in my heart. I got Jesus in my heart. That's how I'm saved. But, you know, does that even say that here? No, it says, if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God the Father raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ by our Father, and if he's satisfied with him 100%, of his sacrifice on the cross and his shed blood and crucified body, then he's satisfied. And if our Father, the one who owns this whole universe, is satisfied, I should be satisfied with it too. And that's what i got to believe in. If he didn't resurrect Jesus, he wouldn't be satisfied. It's the satisfaction of our Father that we're trusting in more than even Jesus Christ himself. And so it's not just Jesus in our heart. Oh, wow. See, that's why we've got that all wrong. When you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead or the resurrected Jesus, then the Holy Spirit and Spirit birthed you as a spiritual son of the Father. No man, look, I like this first scripture. Uh, well, I don't know if the Holy Spirit's working in this. They said they believe. If they said they believe, that's good enough for me. In fact, when I talk to these people in these salvation times, I'll ask them several times, do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord? Oh, yeah. Do you believe that the Father raised him from the dead? Oh, yeah. Well, see, I already know they've already believed it right there because they believe the Father raised him from the dead. They already believe in Jesus the Lord. But no man can say, look at there, in 1 Corinthians 12, 3b, no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So if they say they believe in Jesus as Lord and they say they believe the Father raised him from the dead, they already got the criterion right there in, in Romans 10, 9. You know, so it's already done. So, you know, but I'll go ahead and let them pray at the end. That's fine. But they already kind of made the decision right there. See, but they don't know that. For verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So they need to confess it with their mouth, and that's why they pray the prayer. I tell them, you need to say it out loud. And I say that when they do the prayer so they know that they need to say it, you know. And that way it, the confession is made unto salvation. When we believe and our spirit birth is the spiritual son of the Father, we are given absolute righteousness at that time. We had temporary righteousness because of what he paid for on the cross. But when we receive him as our spiritual son and, Lord, and we receive him now with our new identity, we now have absolute righteousness. Verse 11, for as the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So if we were believing on him, we will confess with him out. We won't be ashamed. Now I like this, these verses in, in uh, 12 and 13. For there's no difference of Jew uh, between Jew and Greek, and I, I like him mentioning Jew first and Greek second. That's the way he usually does it, except the one verse. For the same Lord is over all rich unto all that call. Notice that it says the word call upon him. For And I use this verse here. This verse is just like John 3.16 in Paul's Romans uh, 10.13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we call on the name of the Lord. Now, when I have them pray the prayer, they pray, Dear Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus, uh, because they're calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, you know, that's just the way I do it. But, I, you know, you can do it any way you want to. Paul in Romans 8, 10 to 13 goes into more complete detail than even what John did in John 3, 16. But looking again in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he the Father gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth, and see, that's the key of transitioning to receiving the Lord as and the new birthing as a son of the Father and a new creation life. Believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then I read that verse a while ago in, a, in advance. 
Romans 10, 17. So then faith or belief, that's the same word, the faith or belief cometh by hearing and hearing by the rhema word of Christ. Now, I know your King James says a word of God. Uh, seven out of ten renderings of scriptures calls it the word of Christ or Christon. Or, and the Theos, the other ones, it means God the Father. But either way, you hear about God the Father raising him from the dead, or you hear about Christ being Lord of all, that's all right. Uh, God can use that, and the Holy Spirit will use that. You many people get saved. So we get faith or belief by hearing the word of Christ that the Holy Spirit will use to birth us into the family of God. Once we've heard the incorruptible seed of Christ or the truth of the gospel, we receive that rainbow word, and with the decision of our will, believe that rainbow word. Then the Holy Spirit takes the incorruptible seed, and just like in the natural birthing, you have a woman's ovum, and you've got uh, a seed that goes in there, a man, the couples with 23 chromosomes, they join and come together, and nine months out comes the baby, uh, what we call the natural birthing. The spirit birthing is the very same way. Our spirit has been like an empty spirit of them from the time we were born in the flesh and it's been waiting to be fertilized by the spiritual seed of the father which is christ the crumple word and when that seed of that word goes inside of us we are joined and immediately become one with the father we come born again into the family new family of god we are a son of God, a joint heir with a new identity. Oh, we have it all right then. We get a new spiritual nature, everything. We become immediately into absolute oneness with our Father at that time. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.14. And we're going to go through this passage, and it's got some lovely stuff in it. But I want, And we talked about life out of death. We're going to talk about that again. Verse 14 says in 2 Corinthians 5, For the love of Christ constrains us means we are constrained. You know, boy, that, it surrounds us, and I think it does. And the more you know about the Father, the more you love the Father, the more the Father loves you. Because we just judge that if one died for all, we're all dead. Now, what this is telling us, when Christ died on the cross, not only were we co-crucified with Christ, or together with him, and we were co-buried with him, and we were co-raised with him, boy, I tell you what, this death that we had together with him uh, gave us the death we need to move into spiritual life. Because all mankind first had to co-die with Christ on the cross. And if we don't understand that, that's what really happened there. Verse 15 says, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live of themselves. Now, that why that's in blue is because that's a bunch of flesh. We don't want to live to ourselves. We don't go back and start trying to live a natural physical identity, which is no more. We want to live in the new spiritual identity because he's already given us that. Why would we want to live this way? But we live unto him who died for them and rose, rose again. So we had to be spiritual birth with eternal life to live unto our Father. And now that we have this new spiritual identity, we can live unto our Father. Verse 16, and we've heard this several times today and other last as well. Wherefore, henceforth we know and uh, this is this oidai that you're talking about. That's a, that is not like gnosko. Gnosko is experiential knowledge. But oidai is reflective knowledge from our mind and heart, from what we've known in the past, and bring it back to remembrance again. So henceforth, from all of our remembrances, everything we physically know or know, we know no man anymore after the flesh. Yea, though we've known Christ, or epigonosko, Christ after the flesh, because we learned a lot about Christ. Spirit gave us a lot of knowledge, understanding, but we don't know him that way anymore. That's Jesus in Nazareth. That's Jesus in the natural body. That's Jesus in the earthly physical identity that he had. Now he's been raised, so who is he now? He's, a, he's another son of God. He's this, he, he was the firstborn from the dead. He's now the son of the Father again in a glorified body. Not I'm not present, not omniscient, not omnipotent, but he's just like you and I as a spiritual son of God. And all sons are in this new family of God. So it says, even though we've known Christ, 
henceforth we don't want to ever know him that way anymore from all of our knowledge, Epikonosko. We don't want to know him that way anymore. In fact, we don't want to know anyone or Christ after the flesh or after our original identity from our flesh birth. That's no longer the identity we should ever be serving or working through. And verse 17 is the verse we know and love. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. I like new species, as Curtis tells us. That, that's, that's a good term, new species. It's never been here on this face of this earth, as, as Brenda told us. It's never been that way. Old things are passed away. All old things. They should be. I'm not sure that they always are. But according to the Word of God, they are. Now, if we want to keep coming up and pulling them up, I think somebody used the example like pulling an old dead corpse on her back. <laughs> Sometimes we want to do that, but I wouldn't recommend that. That, that's, that doesn't smell good. It doesn't feel good. <laughs> but we do that when we pull these things up. we got to get our minds renewed so we're walking in our new spiritual identity by the Spirit and living there on a regular basis till it's spontaneous. All things have become new. Did he say some of the things? Wow, well, I will read this, what he says. When we are a spirit birthed by the Holy Spirit, we are a new creature a, as a spiritual son of the Father with a new spiritual son identity. We have the Father's eternal life with a new spiritual nature. That's 2 Peter 1, 4 again. New nature. We, don't, we didn't have that before. We now have it. And we should have all the things that we have our Father. We're now one with him. We're in equality with him. We don't understand that sometimes, but we are. Look at verse 18. And all things are of God the Father who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, I think uh, our brother Curtis talked a lot about that. I think even Brenda mentioned some of that about reconciliation. All that's important because that's the ministry that we have. So you, are you looking what you need to do as a spiritual son? Well, he's reconciled us to himself and we in turn should help reconcile others to him now we can't do it without the help of the holy spirit and we should not do it out of his word or direction but i think that's why we're here and still left here i mean after all if we're a spiritual son of god he can take us on to heaven immediately right but why are we left here ah peter said it we are his workmanship created in christ jesus unto good works which he did foreordain that we should walk in them Ephesians 2.10. Uh, he's got a plan. He's already got things we walk into. And part of this is a ministry of reconciliation. We've all got a ministry for that. The Father in his eternal plan complete all things with us and for us to reconcile us to himself with an eternal fellowship in absolute oneness and equality with him. To the wit, verse 19, that God the Father was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them. I like that, not imputing. Now, I made a difference between sin and trespass. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. But I look at huh? I, I look at trespasses as not quite bad, bad, bad enough for sin. He already took care of sin on the cross. He said he forgave all sin. And I, I think he forgave all trespasses too. But the deal is, we still, I look at trespasses as more disobedience against the Father. We can do all kinds of things now that we are saved from sin. Yeah, past, present, future. But we certainly trespass by disobeying our Father. And I think he's even forgiven those, but he's not imputing us, them to us. It says here he's not going to impute them to us. But we need to, we need to ask, I, if I do something that I know is wrong, I'll say, Father, that was wrong. Help me to not be disobedient to you anymore. Help me to not do, always live in obedience to you and everywhere. And I like that tr that trusting and yielding and, and, and obedience. I think that yielding comes first out of the heart. I like that. And, uh, and then the, when obedience comes out of our mind, it follows our heart. That's in yielding, total yielding. I think it's total yielding. We've got to be where we're totally walking in this spiritual son identity every day with the Father and hearing his word and hearing his voice and following everything he wants us to do. Now, he's committed unto us the word or the logos of reconciliation. The Father, through and in Christ, reconciled all mankind to himself. 
and no longer will impute our, any of our trespasses against us. Trespasses are willful disobedience or wrongdoing against our fathers or others. A lot of times it's against others. You know, he said, what is this, Ephesians 4.24, be angry and sin not? Well, uh, I'd say be angry and trespass not, too, you know, all that. Because, so what do we do? We get back in the flesh. We do something in the flesh. And he said, you need to not let the sun go down on your wrath. You need to get some forgiveness and take care of it before the sun sets. The Father desires us, empowers us to be ambassadors with the word of reconciliation to others, just as we've been reconciled to God. And then this goes back almost Jesus. Not that we're going to get Jesus in the natural again, but he did talk to them and forgive others as the Father's forgiven you. Praise prayers like that. Verse 21 is the one we really love a lot, and we use it a lot. For he, the Father, hath made him, Jesus Christ, to, and I like this better, to be a sin offering for us. You know, it just we say sin, but it was a sin offering. Because in the Old Testament, the high priest went in once a year and had to take the blood of, 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 of goats and actually take and drop bloods in the mercy seat. The holy high priest could go behind the holy of holies and do that once a year, and that pushed back all the sins for one year at a time, but it was temporal. And this is the eternal sin offering that paid for all sins for once and for all, never to be repeated again. And it doesn't have to be. That's why when it was all over <laughs> and he said it's finished, God the Father tore that veil from top to bottom, indicating that no longer did man have to go through a veil or through a high priest to go in the holy place, that we could come boldly before the throne of God because of what he did. And that's so important to know. He paid the foul sin offering for us. Jesus Christ, who not in intervals did not, not know sin, but that we might be made the absolute righteousness of God the Father in him. The Father, Jesus Christ, an eternal sin offering for us, even though Christ never knew and us go sin that we would be made the absolute rights of the Father. Now look at 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 16. Living in the Spirit, and I titled this because this little section is kind of like living in the Spirit. What man knoweth the things of a man, say the Spirit of a man. And I, we had several people talk in this passage already. I think, I think David, Curtis, uh, Brenda, I think we've all talked into this passage in some parts. But I want to go through this thoroughly. It's line by line, precept upon precept. What man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Holy Spirit of God. Well, it says you can only know the things of man. You know, it already said, I cannot see, ear cannot hear. Not can hear of the man. We talked about that a few minutes ago, the first part of 9 and 10 before this. So, where we think we're going to ever do it. You don't get saved by yourself. You get saved by what he did and through spirit birthing. You think you're going to now, as Paul talks in Galatians 3, 1, you think you're going to be made perfect in the flesh after you're born again? No. You'll never live in the flesh to be born again. You'll never live in the flesh to be perfect. We ain't going to get saved by our performance. We don't keep saved by our performance. We only get saved by the things of the Spirit of God. So you can only know the things of a man through the man's spirit operating in your original identity, and you can only know the things of the Father by the Holy Spirit operating in your spiritual son identity. This is why it's so hard for us, because we're trying to play below the line, yet we want to be above the line, but we never have gotten out from below the line. And we... we got to let the Holy Spirit teach and reveal these things. Verse 12, now that we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Holy Spirit, which is of God, that we might, and this right here doesn't even talk about just kind of know by reflection, but it says it's in the perfect tense that we might completely know the things that, and it says that are freely given, but you know what it really says there? It says the things that are being once then granted to us, and you know why it says once then? When it says once then, that's the aorist one tense. Aorist two tense is point or punctuate your action over and over like eating meals. But when it's aorist one tense, it means one time, and it's usually in the past, never to be repeated. It's done. It's complete. Even though it's not perfect, it's still done. 
So what happens there? When you get born again, you've been once then granted to us to be God the Father's Son, the spiritual identity, a new nature. It's all done once. You don't do it over again. You don't get born again more than once. You don't get spiritually born, naturally born, or spiritually born more than once. It's all one time. It's over. It's done. So natural birthing, spiritual birthing, one time, never be repeated. Nicodemus found that out, all right. The Holy Spirit, uh, it says there, is uh, the paraclete or helper is given to us to completely know the things that our Father has granted to us in our new spiritual identity. It does say there in Ephesians that, that the Holy Spirit has sealed us till the day of redemption, till we get our bodies. So he's, he's there teaching us all along and everything. Verse 13, which we also speak, not with the words which man's wisdom teaches. See, man's wisdom always, and I told you the other day when I mentioned this, man always tells you just get a bunch of knowledge, go to the seminar, cemetery, whatever you do, get a bunch of knowledge, put it all together, and you'll have some wisdom. Well, that's natural wisdom. That has nothing to do with the wisdom that comes from God. In fact, I think the wisdom that comes from God is more a person than it is anything else. Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians one twenty four says he's the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is the power of God. And we've read in Colossians 2, 3, it says, in Father, and in, in Christ are hid all, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we get all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge from God the Father and the Son. It's all coming from him. He's the source of all wisdom in the Spirit and all real knowledge in the Spirit. So, verse 13 says, The things we speak, not the works of man wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So Paul's not talking about original flesh identity and natural wisdom, but he's talking about the new spiritual son identity, where the Holy Spirit can lead and renew his mind with true spiritual things. And then we get those rivers of knowledge coming together with that understanding. And that's what we want. Verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Holy Spirit of God the Father, for they are foolishness unto him. See, all that's in blue, carnal thinking. <laughs> Neither can he know them. Natural, carnal thinking, we'll never know, because you can't know, see, hear with your natural heart, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, there's a good word, discernment. Discern. That's what Everyone in the whole body of Christ needs is spiritual discernment. We don't know the difference between MMR and truth. We don't know the difference between the old identity and the new identity. There's no discernment. Unless you're born again, you don't even have a way to get discernment. And unless you're seeking the Father and loving Him and spending time and letting Him speak to you, you won't get any sermon either. So you got to have that time fit. You cannot operate in your original identity and receive the things of the Holy Spirit. You cannot have any spiritual discernment. That's only through spiritual sonship identity. Can you have that spiritual discernment? But I like this, but he that is spiritual, and that word judge, judge, judge it really says the man that's spiritual examines all things, and yet he's not, a, he's not examined of any man. Now, Oh, that's why I didn't use judgment. I used examples. I can examine you, brother. <laughs> but but what it's talking about, we don't want to get involved in looking at people. But I tell you what, if you're really getting the word of the Father, you're all going to know it. If I don't have the word of the Father, you're all going to know it. We don't have to worry about it. But if you're really getting the thing from the Holy Spirit and the Father, you know, you, you've examined all things. I mean, I didn't put this lesson together here. It, it took me 24 hours. And listen to the Father, getting every word. I want to hear what the word of the Father says about it all. So it's not my words. It's the rhema that comes from the Father in me. And if you don't hear that or see that, I'm sorry, but that's, that's the way I know it. And so that's all I can do is give that the way I see it. But he that's spiritual judges all things. The one operating in, as the spiritual son identity has spiritual discernment with spiritual wisdom, full knowledge and understanding beyond the knowledge of everybody else that's trying to do this Below the line, it will not be the same, and that you'll know the difference. For who is known, or he know, the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct the Lord? But we ever have the mind of Christ. And that's in the present tense, which means it's all the time we have the mind of Christ. Some people said, well, no, you got your mind, and you got to get it renewed. 
She don't have the mind of Christ. Well, I don't know, but when I got a Christ, I got a whole Christ. When I got the Word and born again, I got the whole Father. I got the whole spiritual sonship. I got the new nature. I got everything. I, I'm, I'm in the same express image with my Father. Now, you tell me that I don't have the mind of the Father, and the Christ has the mind of the Father, and I don't have the same mind? No, I have that mind, too. Because I want you to know that's what that means there. That's spiritual truth beyond what people at that day could even understand. And what most of the church does not understand. Oh, no, brother, you can't have the mind of Christ. If I'm born again and a son of the Father, I have the mind of the Father and of Christ. And there's no difference. They're all in the express image. We're all in equality with one another in this new family of God. Why do we want to diminish any part of the new family of God? Those operating in the spiritual son identity will ever have the mind of Christ that is one with the Father and is taught by the Holy Spirit. When we're born again, we have a new spiritual son identity to become one with our Father. We have now become a spiritual son of God the Father and a joint heir with Jesus, the only begotten Son. And, of course, several people mentioned this today. Brother David, I talked with him about it. He mentioned it again. Uh, he did his sermon. But as many as received him... That's Jesus. To them he gave power or authority, also the Father, to be birthed to become the sons of God the Father, even to them that believe on his name. So when we ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, when we ask him to come and born us again, and the Father puts us in new birth, Holy Spirit works through that and does it all, we become a new spiritual son of the Father. We have a new spiritual identity. And that's what this is saying here. You become, and this, this become, even on the King James, all it says become, but in the Greek it says to be birthed to become. This is a birthing statement, a spiritual birthing statement, right there in that one verse. When we hear, believe with the Holy Spirit-led decision to receive the incorruptible seed of Christ into that spirit of them, we're born again by the Holy Spirit of God the Father. And it says, and I know David likes to always repeat 13 with it, which are born not of blood, when your natural flesh or birth or where you came from, nor the will of man. That's why you can't say it was your own belief that did it. No, no, he gave you even the, the, the ability to believe and to have faith. But of God the Father, he was the one that originated before the foundation of the world. He created, uh, he carried spiritual birth even before we were even born. He knows exactly how it works. It's all done by his Holy Spirit. And so we need to trust him. Because this is all talking about things of the Spirit by the Holy Spirit doing all these things of the Father. Spirit birthing is as a spiritual son of the Father is not by your natural bloodline or background, not even by your own fleshly will. Oh, I wanted to, and that's how it happened. No, we don't know that. You may think that, but it says it's not the will of your natural original identity. It says, but of the Father by the conviction and direction of the Holy Spirit. I didn't think I was convicted. Well, maybe you were. Why do, why do you think you're born again? Well, you chose. You gave a decision. I believe, and when I believe, the instantaneously it happened. It's like that. The death of Christ on the cross and the co-death of all mankind in his death, 1 Corinthians 5, 14, was followed in three days later by the Father's resurrection of Jesus. At that point, the Father gave all mankind imputed or temporary righteousness to enable them to hear and to receive the rhema word of the preacher and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. All of mankind now has the right or authority to believe and call on the name of the Lord Jesus to become spirit birth as the spiritual son of the Father. This new family of God is where all sons, including Jesus Christ, were joined and became one in equality with the Father and the Holy Spirit. This is the new family of God. And we're part of that. And the, and the Lord Jesus Christ is part of that too. He's another son along with us. As all sons are part and tied with the Father and the Holy Spirit in the new family of God. We have our minds transformed and renewed by the Holy Spirit to understand uh, that we were born again by our empty spirit of them, receiving the incorruptible word of God or the seed of Christ, 
And with that, when we receive that eternal life of the Father through the Word or seed of Christ, in the Father's plan, He brings life out of death. That may be all. <laughs> Father, we just thank you for the word that you've given us today. May it be that rhema word that reaches every heart, that we may perceive your truth and love of everything that you planned for us to be your spiritual sons with a new spiritual identity. And we know that's why you, your whole purpose for spiritual birth was to bring us into that spiritual sonship as your sons, as your ones that you fellowship in equality with, throughout all eternity with, in this new family of God. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that's also in this new family that's teaching and leading us and guiding us day by day in all things. And we know that you've given him uh, to us and us to him for that teaching and leading and transformation of mind and heart. Thank you for it 